chapter 5-1, Night City Stories. Contrary to what V had told Jackie, she did not go see the Maelstrom gang first. After some thoughts, she decided to go see Evelyn Parker, the woman at the center of the gig. Dex had told V to meet Evelyn at Lizzie's bar as soon as possible, between 6 p.m. and 6 a.m. 6 p.m. was still hours away and V needed to pass the time somehow. What better way to pass the time than by earning some eddies? Coach Fred, who'd always been preview of news about fighting, had told V about some street fights around Night City. If she was interested in fighting, he would act as her manager and make the arrangements. The fights were not official though. They were illegal underground fights with one wall, fist only. V decided to meet and fight her first opponent in the Kabuki district. When she had met her opponent, she immediately wished that there had been a rule stipulating that the fights were only one on one. It just so happened that her opponent was claiming to be a twin. Not a twin by normal definitions, mind you, but a guy with a carbon copy of himself. He contested that they, he and his copy, were one. They even went so far as claiming to share the same thoughts as well as one wife between the both of them. And as far as the fight was concerned, there was a catch. Since they were both one and the same, V had to fight both of them at the same time. It was far from the fight she was expecting. So she raised the stake and offered 2,000 eddies as opposed to the initial 500. The fight was difficult, but she eventually won. Afterwards, her body was bruised, but her pockets were full of eddies. Later on that day after V was done nursing her wounds from the fight with the so-called twins, she headed to Lizzie's bar. It was dark then, and as usual, Night City came truly alive, unlike anything seen during the day. Neon signs and lights plastered on buildings, street signs, corners, and even floors. The trash, dirt, and drugs were still there, but the lights created a mirage, one that highlighted just the right places. She found Lizzie's bar wedged under a bypass across a double two-lane street. A tall pink neon sign of a woman with a skull tattoo and a battle axe over her head, doing a high kick like a rockets dancer, stood much higher than the actual building. Lower, right on top of the entrance, was the electric blue sign, Lizzie's, written in an exaggerated and stylized serif font. V crossed the street, making sure not to get run over by a car, and made for the entrance. Two neon feminine figures straddled each side of the door in contrasting pink and blue. One had a bat and the other an axe. There were a few people too, hanging out in front of the building. They blended in the dark along with the bags of trash that were piled up in shadowed corners away from the neon lights. V stepped up to the double door that was being guarded by two women. The one in front of the entrance wore guns holstered under both her prosthetic cyber arms. She also carried a studded baseball bat and had milky white porcelain skin with bright pink hair tied up to a double pigtail. There was a prominent Mox tattoo on her chest. V had heard that the Mox gang, which offered protection to sex workers, was based out of Lizzie's bar. The woman in front of her substantiated that rumor. And even without any telling tattoos, V figured that the other woman who was leaning by the door was most likely a Mox too. She had dark, chocolate skin darker than V's and wore her hair short in a pompadour style. Both women, along with the provocative and loud color clothing, had an effortless street swag in their mannerism and they seemed to entice and check the male gaze at the same time. The woman in front catcalled to V. Hey there, doll face. Like a tag team, the one in the back jumped in and between puffs of a cigarette asked, Interest you in a preem BD? What do you got? What don't we got? Women and men of your dreams. Synaptic acting A-listers, no washed up virtue porn boy toys or blow up dolls here. The first one continued with the sales pitch. Oh, tur stuff. It'll grip your heart and blow your nerves right out of your body. Pure bit-based ecstasy. That's why people come here. Clearly know how to sell it replied V impressed. The first one retorted, Not a sales pitch, it's a warning. I'll give you one word, bespoke. Not for everyone to sign Right before the other asked, Think you can handle it? V replied, Bespoke? Damn, that sounds promising. I get it, I'm in. The first one fiddled with her baseball bat as she explained some ground rules. Mm -hmm. 
things you need to know first. <clears throat> Severe penalties for any unauthorized recording. No drugs, no groping. Again, the second one added without missing a beat. Someone catch your eye? You do not grab them. You find them in the catalog, ask for a BD, and get yourself a box. V was a little offended and replied with more malice than intended. I really look that green to you. Like I don't know. Mm-hmm. Doors open. They welcomed the curtain. Have fun, doll. The double doors slid Welcome open to, to reveal a beaded curtain. V gently pushed her way in, hearing the clicking of the fallen beads that her body had parted. The next room was a lobby. Most of the people there were sitting on a couch in front of a round coffee table. A pink neon light traced the path on the floor, leading to the official entrance that sat right next to a receiving counter. A white screen on top of the receiving counter was advertising a show called Watson Whore. In the ad, a topless woman with an obvious bulge of tucked meat puked over a toilet. Below the sign, neon lights tinted everything behind the counter in a pink hue. From the lines of coats that hung to both sides of an electric blue neon sign to the mocks attendant. Music with a deep thumping bass sifted through from somewhere deeper in the club. V followed the music. All at once, a harmonic marriage of lights and sound mesmerized her senses. Loud bass thumping music swaddled her ears as neon lights, mostly pink and electric blue, massaged her vision. A current of fog sipped through her jeans and caressed her shins. There was also a distinct smell that hugged her nostrils. It wasn't a smell that V could put her finger on. It was an abstract scent that sang of pleasure. She turned her head and drank in the environment. Various groups of people energized every corner of the place. People leaned on the railing upstairs. The booths were packed. The couches were lined with blue-eyed entranced zombies. The dance floors were reasonably occupied with moving bodies. Lastly, the bar, like an oasis within an oasis, beckoned V on their enticing neon light. She placed herself at the stool in front of the bartender and at the right of two chatting ladies. The bartender was dressed casually in a blue Hawaiian shirt tucked into dark slack. The shirt was unbuttoned and led eyes all the way down to his hips. But even with parts of his chest exposed, all attention was drawn to his face. He regarded V with unusual eyes that were the reverse of what was considered normal eyes. Bright light pupils set within a sea of black. The eyes, friendly, commended attention and stood out from the handsome face. A face sculpted like those being used to sell things to people. There was a line of chrome that contoured the hard features of his face. With a touch of metallic in his voice, he said to V. Get you something. What's on the menu? V considered asking her about her contact right away, but decided to make a friend out of him first. She ordered something, and to start the conversation she asked, So, curious, the name Lizzie's, that the owner? He replied, Not for a long while, no. And it's none too sweet a story. V encouraged them on. Oh, now I'm just flat interested. He explained, Real Lizzie ran a strip joint out of this place back in the day. Lizzie's bar. Those were paid right, insured, and had decent security. Good spot, all in all. V added, Let me guess, it didn't last. He shook his head and answered, No, Tiger Claws took care of that. Tiger beat one of Lizzie's girls real bad ones. No hesitation, Lizzie blasted the guy's balls off. The gang came back the next day. When he gestured with an arm, V spotted prosthetic fingers on one hand. The forearm was covered with small tattoos. This was done. We tried to make sense of the history of the place. Tigers gave this place up to the mocks in the end though, didn't they? He corrected her by explaining. Sort of. The moxes had to make a deal with them. Luckily, they kept their heads organized quick. Big boss now is Susie Q. But the sign stayed up, out of respect. Biz booms to this day. With pleasantries out of the way, V thought it was a good time to ask about her contact. She said. Looking for Evelyn Parker. Know if she's here? He asked. Who's asking? And she thought a tip might ease the information out of him. A big tipper. Generous when I get the answers I'm looking for. He answered honestly. Appreciate the gesture, truly. But afraid I don't get paid to talk. Opposite, actually. But after he had finished explaining his reason, a woman on a stool nearby said to him. It's all right, Mateo. Let's wait for this one. She came over to V 
and with a casual wave to the bartender, tacitly ordered a round of drink. The bartender fished out a dark orange bottle and filled two short glasses. The woman leaned over the counter next to V. With a satisfied expression on her face, she watched the bartender work. Then she introduced herself to V. Evelyn Parker. Proud eyes looked out to V on their short bangs. The blue hair fitted her quite nicely and even looked natural. Only her dark eyebrows gave away the true color of the dyed hair. There was a quiet confidence in her pleasant face that simmered behind her eyes. It told of ambitious goals, of someone who wanted more out of life. The furred collar of her coat bristled out and entangled into her hair. Under the coat, she wore a short, pricey dress that dazzled merrily at the touch of lights. Red, thin, high boots almost met the bottom of her dress. With confidence, Evelyn continued. I knew it was you as soon as you walked in. V took the glass to her lips. She instantly recognized that it was her favorite drink, and she downed it eagerly. Curious, she asked Evelyn. That's not. Only tequila I drink. Hm. How would you know? Evelyn replied. I like to know everything about the people I work with. Either that or it was just a lucky guess. V asked about the choice of venue. Why are we meeting here? Any particular reason? Actually, it doesn't seem much like your thing, this place. The bartender chimed in audibly and got a disapproving sideways glance from Evelyn before she replied. Hmm. I'll take that as a compliment. She downed her drink too. Come on. No place we can talk where ears won't prick up to listen. And as she walked away, she announced to the bartender. We'll be in the lounge, Mateo. If anyone asks, we're not here. V followed her through another set of double doors that led to a dark hallway bathed in scant neon red light. Workers dressed in enticing clothing were putting the moves on potential clients. Evelyn opened a sliding door a little down the hallway to reveal a dark booth. A holographic projection of a woman danced over the coffee table that illuminated the room with faint warm lights. V made herself comfortable on the long curving leather couch. Evelyn closed the door and a red line of light announced to them that the room was locked and to outsiders that it was occupied. She fished out a cigarette from her small purse, then set to her lips and lit it. She didn't say a word until after releasing her first smoke-filled breath. Evelyn finally said, Dex had a load to say about you. Called you professional, effective, and trustworthy. I hope he wasn't overselling. V could see the pretense under her compliment. She jumped to the heart of it and said bluntly, You don't give a rat's dick what Dex thinks. We both know that. You have trouble accepting compliments? Evelyn noted. No, just think flattery's beneath you. Am I wrong? Replied V. Evelyn crossed behind the coffee table and took a seat next to V. She asked. Have you known each other long? Started working with him, in fact. V replied honestly. Evelyn continued between breaths of smoke. I've heard there are two kinds of fixers. Those with stable crews on long contracts and short leashes. Loyalty and predictability they value above all else. Then there's the other kind. Dex's kind. V wanted to get down to business, ignored her comment and asked. Let's cut to the chase. What do you got for me? Your target. I trust you know what it is. Evelyn asked. V told her what she knew of the job. Relic. Secure your soul, Trinket. Key tech in the program, actually. We're tangling with Arasaka. Making this heist one dangerous, risky motherfucker. Evelyn agreed and added, Mm-hmm. Arasaka's poured billions into personality transfer technology. But me, I just want the data on this one. The chip is tucked away inside Compeki Plaza, the hotel. You ever been? V has never been at the hotel, in told her. You know? Just never rolled through that neighborhood. Damn shame. The fresh they serve is sinfully good. Evelyn remarked. Chef must have made a deal with the devil. Again, V, returning to business, asked. So where's this chip hiding, exactly? In a suite on the top floor. The room's occupied by Yorinobu Arasaka. Evelyn answered and ordered the name casually. V asked in disbelief. Yorinobu Arasaka? He's in town? Evelyn answered with pride of the knowledge. Don't you read the scream sheets? The media couldn't get enough of Yori coming to Night City. It was all over the headlines. 
Anyway, he's heir apparent to the Arasaka Empire. Saburo Arasaka's only surviving son. V tried to wrap her head around the men's presence in Night City. What, so Arasaka Jr. is planning to grab the reins while in Night City? Evan said, with cool. Only a handful of people in Night City know what the Arasaka's real plans are. V asked. Telling me you're one of them? When Evan didn't answer, she added, Look, if you've got any spare aces up your sleeve, now's the time to show them. Evan elaborated. Now this should make your tits perk up. Yorinobu recently swiped the chip from an Arasaka laboratory. He's made a deal with Netwatch, aims to sell it to them. Have you spotted my ace yet, or do I need to spell things out? V asked, getting a bit impatient. Fine. So no Arasaka security on the device, because Yorinobu whisked it away in secret. Now where's he hiding it? Evan explained. Likely in a specialized container. One that mimics an organic neural environment. On the outside, it looks like an ordinary briefcase. V wanted more details, and... And the case is? Evelyn stood up and headed towards the door while saying, You'll see for yourself soon enough. Provided we're done gossiping about the Arasakas. Okay, what's next? Said V, getting to her feet. Now comes the best part. Evelyn replied. Follow me.